Gracious and loving God, we thank you so much for this day that you have made, for this time to be together in your house and to hear your words for us. We thank you for the safe travels you've given to so many of our loved ones, for the healing that you've offered in so many different ways, for the family and friends who were there for us throughout the holidays and continue to be there for us, for the light that you have given to us that continues to shine. We thank you for all the ways in which you have moved through this world and through our lives. But gracious God, we also lift up those things that are on our hearts and on our minds that continue to need your hands. For our loved ones that are continuing to heal from surgeries, for those who continue to travel, for the school kids while they're out of the structure, for their parents and guardians. For the world around us, God, we lift up all the hurt and all the pain and all the violence. We lift up each of those things to you because you alone can make them there. And God, in the times when the words don't come to ourselves, we instead lift up the prayer you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. favorites and it's called I come with joy and the words are I come with joy a child of God forgiven loved and free the life of Jesus to recall and love laid down for me and that is the essence of what we do when we come to this communion table we recall the life of Jesus and the love laid down for each of us so let us come to the table of love let's go Lord Dear Heavenly Father, we just sang a song that says, Jesus saves. We want to remember that. That when we come to this table, this bread represents your body. This wine represents your blood that was spilled for all of us. We thank you for being here with us today. And we ask that you just continue to help us in our daily walk with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so we remember the night when Christ gathered with his disciples in an upper room. He took a loaf of bread, which they had already been eating on, and he offered a blessing of thanksgiving over it, and began to break it and give it to each of his disciples, saying, This represents my body, broken for each of you, each of it, all of you, in remembrance <coughs> of me. And in the same way, following the meal, he took a cup, and he offered a blessing of thanksgiving over that cup. He began to pour its contents into each of his disciples' cups. He said, this represents my blood. Pour out for forgiveness for each of your sins. So drink of it all of you in remembrance of my sacrifice.
try to make it without the cough drop with me. All right. We are in Zephaniah. Who's heard of Zephaniah? <laughs> We're writing all kinds of new new prophets here at Wadi Christian Church. He's right after our buddy Habakkuk. And we were in a couple weeks ago. So we're, we're following through there. We're on Zephaniah chapter 3. It's page 1467 of your pew Bible. 5667. I don't know where it is in your personal Bibles, but like I say, it's after our buddy Habakkuk. And then you get to Haggai, you've gone too far. You know, all those main ones that you know all about. Okay. Hear the words from Zephaniah. Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout aloud, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you, and never again will you fear any harm. On that day, they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. The sorrows for the appointed feasts I will remove from you. They are a burden and a reproach to you. At that time, I will deal with all who oppress you. I will rescue the land and gather those who have been scattered. I will give them praise and honor in every land where they were put to shame. At that time, at that time, I will gather you. At that time, I will bring you home. I will give you honor and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your very eyes, says the Lord. May it be so. Today, I know it seems like a stretch for those of us gathered here, but today we celebrate the gift of music. After all, what would Christmas be without music? Of course, we all have different tastes in music, right? I think about the father and son driving home from church, and the father puts it on country music, and the kid rolls his eyes, and oh, how do you listen to this stuff? It's all sad, and about dogs, and pickup trucks, and bar rooms, and broken hearts. The father, knowing that the son likes that hard rock music, he said, what is your music about? He said, that's the beauty of it. You don't know. <laughs> Regardless of your age or your vocation, most of us have some kind of music we can relate to. Think about the story of the young mother who bought her child the, the Cinderella movie. Okay, and... You know, when children are little, they want to watch the same movie over and over and over again. It's the summertime, so they had all the windows up as they watched the same movie over and over and over again. And these guys were doing some roofing work on the house next door. And the mom went out to get the mail, and she overheard these three burly men. And one of, one of them said, put it together, and what have you got? And the other on the other side said, bibbidi bobbidi bibbidi bobbidi bibbidi bobbidi boo It sticks with you, music does, in ways that just words don't always do. Frederick Nietzsche once said, without music, life would be a mistake. And he's right, absolutely. Um, there's a story one of my friends tells, and she was not raised in the church, had no connection to the church whatsoever, and really had kind of fallen on some really difficult times and gotten into some stuff that was causing her a lot of grief, a lot of pain. And one day she just happened upon a, a little church and stumbled inside and, and uh, was kind of just listening because they had music playing. You know, it kind of caught her ear. And she stumbled inside, and her words, I wish I could say it word for word, but it was something along the lines of it pulled her in and split her wide open. That idea that music just kind of spoke to her so fully. In fact, she tells a story that she would go, then every Sunday she liked to go and just listen to the music, and when they finished the last song before the sermon would start, she'd fly out the back. Until one day that the last song was so pure and so raw and so just, I mean, just hit her in such a way she couldn't leave. And that was the day that she was finally ready to hear about Jesus in a new way. That's what the power of music can do to us. Perhaps you've had something like that happen to you, where music has just washed over you in ways that words sometimes go, but 
there's something about a song that hits differently. Our story for today comes from Zephaniah, and it begins like a song, right? O daughter Zion, shout aloud, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you, and never again will you fear any harm. Obviously, it's a future that they see when they say these things. On this day, after the calendar marking for the celebration, we continue as, a, as people of faith. Something important has happened in a manger in Bethlehem, and we must not be silent about it. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with us, said Zephaniah, and says the babe today. Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout aloud, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart. We kind of half-heartedly do that, but the scripture tells us to sing and rejoice with all of our heart. Verse 17 of that same chapter says this, The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you. With singing. But you didn't catch that when I read it before. I rejoice over you with singing. God will. Not angels. Not people in the pews. God will sing over you. God takes such delight in us that God sings over us. I have that image, you know, of a mother over a newborn in the cradle. You know, singing a lullaby, putting them back to sleep, making them know they're loved and cared for. Stay right here, I got you. Hush, little baby, don't say a word. Right? Can you hear God singing to us now? I have a, a friend of mine that was in school with me that their family had a tradition on Christmas Eve. They would go outside and listen for the music. Now, they lived in the country, so there was no bands playing somewhere. There was no radio at somebody's house that you could overhear. It was simply the trees where the wind would go through them and the dogs barking from somewhere, perhaps a cow somewhere, uh, chickens, I don't know what else was there. But that was their tradition. They would go out and they would listen for the singing, <coughs> listen for the angels singing. Most of them just thought, well, this is just kind of a cool thing to do. It's a tradition now. We've done it once. We have to do it forever, right? We have to make time for it. Uh, it's cool. Maybe if it happens one day and we actually hear the angels singing, that's really cool. But I imagine within that, some of them believed it would really happen. If they made the time, if they went out there and believed, they would really hear the angels singing. Sounds like a lot of reasons why we go to church, too. It is the testimony of Zephaniah that God sings over us. I think about the Christmas song, Do you see what I see? Do you hear what I hear? Do you know what I know? Where a night wind says to the little lamb and a shepherd boy says to a mighty king, each of those things, referring to do you see, do you know, do you hear what Christmas really means? A child, a child born in a manger that will bring goodness and light to all. If we listen closely, maybe we will hear the voice of God singing over us. Now you may wonder why we sing at Christmas time. And you may wonder why in the world God would sing over us. But it begins with love. Love always makes your heart sing, doesn't it? You have that new love feeling. It begins with God's love for us, which in turn results in our love for God and our love for others. There's a story about a family, and they were falling on hard times, to put it nicely. They really didn't have money for... Christmas uh, one particular year, and it was a mom and a dad and a, about a six-year-old little boy. So they decided instead of giving actual gifts, they would give pictures of the gifts that they would give if they had the money. That was going to be what they were going to do. So they got out catalogs and printed stuff off the phone and whatever they could come up with that they wanted to give to each one, each another. So the mom opens gifts of the, of the you know, diamond necklace that she could have or the, the brand new car that she's always wanted or the new dream house with a kitchen that she's been thinking of. And the, the dad opens gifts of golf clubs and, and gadgets and galore and whatever you have. And, and of course, all, you know, tons of toys that they wanted to give to their little boy. And he opens up one after the other of all the things. If they had the money, 
they would give to him. Thinking that was the end of it, he said, wait, I've got one for you guys. And he goes in under the Christmas tree and he grabs one last present that he's wrapped for his parents. And they open it up, and it's a crayon drawing, a little crude drawing by a first grader of mom, dad, little boy. And it just simply says, us. All the gifts you could buy when money is available, none of it's going to be more important than us. Us gathered there. He got it. That little boy got it. What we so quickly forgot about. A light dawns and tears stream down our face. What a beautiful image. That is the story that must be told at Christmas. It, that doesn't make your heart seem nothing real. Our lives are filled with love, and God sings over us, and we sing of the wonders of Christmas, but it begins with love, and it reaches its climax in a manger of Bethlehem. Here's what happened in the manger where God took human flesh, right? God came and dwelled among us. Very few recognized him, but God was there in a lowly stable, reconciling the world unto himself outrageous thing to say, but that's what happened there. And people have been singing about it ever since, about that little baby in the manger. There was a story in the Washington Post, this has been a long time ago, um, but it stuck with me. I keep thinking about it. And now they've done like some reenactment stuff. Jimmy Fallon's done it. Some other people have done it. But the original one was about a young man who goes to uh, like a metro station or a subway station and he's dressed in his jeans and a long sleeve shirt and a ball cap. And he goes and he stands kind of over by the trash cans and he gets out a violin and he begins to play. And, you know, they're kind of watching to see what's going to happen. And 1,097 people pass him on their way to their mid-level government jobs with barely a glimpse in his direction. Um, and come to find out it was Joshua Bell, who was an acclaimed virtuoso in the violin, plays in the pops and in many other places. And he was playing a $3.5 million violin. And nobody batted an eye, hardly. They just went on about their business as he played for 43 minutes. Um, six different classical songs, and he just played and played and played and played. When he plays in a concert, he paid roughly $1,000 a minute. He made $32.17 while he played in that subway that day. Uh, 27 people gave money. Only seven stopped for more than a minute uh, to listen to him play. Two of the people that stopped the longest, one was a young man who, or a middle-aged man, who played violin, so he recognized, wait, this is something special. I, this is not your everyday run the meal kind of thing. And one was a woman who actually saw Joshua Bell in concert about three weeks before. So she recognized him literally, that that's who it was, and stopped to see the beauty of being that close. Because, you know, when you go to those concerts uh, with orchestras and stuff, you're not close to anybody uh, on the stage. And so she was, there she was. And it's interesting that the woman that was, uh, that I was talking about was a census worker. So I think it's interesting that a census worker is who recognized this great virtuoso playing in that moment. There he stood playing at rush hour, and people weren't stopping or looking, just rather flipping quarters of all things at this great, very best, you know, musician. When the world's greatest musician playing on the street for coins, but only a few recognized him. Sounds somewhat familiar, doesn't it? Only a few recognized Christ in the stable, too. Some wise men from afar, some, you know, shepherds from the field, a, a carpenter and a bride-to-be, but not many. And yet they ever, the event turned the world upside down. And there it was, this little town of Bethlehem. Why shouldn't all creation sing when that happens? And why shouldn't we sing? Even if we're not good at it, why shouldn't we sing more? After all, the God of creation, the God of the moon and the stars and the wind and the waves, sings over us, washes us with his words and with his tunes. I like the story, you know, C.S. Lewis uh, wrote his books about Narnia to help children understand about God and Christ and, and the world, the creation of the world. In his books, he talked about Aslan, the, the God figure, 
singing the world into being. Isn't that a beautiful image? Thinking about God singing us into being, singing us into health and happiness and joy and peace and hope. Do you hear it? Listen closely. It is a song of an everlasting love and hope and peace and joy. It is a song of Jesus Christ. And that is a song worth singing. We're going to sing as we get ready to talk about discipleship. Hymn number 144, A Little Town of Bethlehem. And as you folks here get to that page, I want us to think about this. The God of creation loves us enough to sing over us. What are we willing to do in response to that song? That's the question that we ask ourselves as we sing this song together and as we leave this place. If he's willing to sing over us, what are we willing to do in response to that song? So let us come to join and sing. Our benediction. We're not singing Bless Be today. We're singing Oh Come All You Faithful, hymn number 148. So if you want to find that, we're going to sing the second verse of that. Just to give you a heads up before we go. My closing words to you actually come from the song we just sang, though, A Little Town of Bethlehem. O holy child of Bethlehem, the sin to us we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in, be born in us.